Hello, everyone. Uh, at risk of seeming paternalistic, uh, I, felt, <laughs> I felt the need to put almost like a warning label on this episode, and it's really a warning label for the rest of this podcast or series of lectures that I'm doing. Uh, my conscience would not allow me to go forward without it, um, and the recording of this episode is a little bit different from the recording of the others in the future, I hope, uh, because this is been recorded in different sessions. I, I wrote up a shorter script, it's about 10 minutes, and I recorded that I, last week. I liked the recording. Um, I didn't post it up yet, but it's ready to go. And then I, as I was looking over it, I was like, no, I, I need to add in both a sort of an introduction and then some extra stuff at, at the end to really contextualize at least my own approach to what I think Nietzsche is saying here. So um, yeah, so let me just get into that. This is going to sound a little embarrassing, but I, I hope it'll make a little more sense um, in, uh, as we go forward. At no point do I necessarily endorse Nietzsche, and I freely admit that he is far from airtight. He's not systematic. He's a very suggestive thinker, precisely because he's very contrarian, especially when it comes to things like morality. He could be compared to a strong medicine. He's certainly not food. He's something unusual, someone unusual, that you would ingest to help you with an unusual illness. Um, and in connection with this, actually, and I'm planning on making this the thumbnail painting for the video, but one of my favorite paintings is The Gross Clinic by uh, Thomas Eakins, who was an American painter. It's a painting from 1875. Uh, Dr. Samuel Gross was one of the early, one of the early new surgeons, as I understand it. He was one of the the leaders of the revolution in in medicine, particularly in surgery. And um, this was as they were starting to get get a hold of anesthetics uh, that enabled new kinds of surgery to be performed. Before this time, as I understand it, surgery meant amputation. Um, but uh, Samuel Gross was one of those who got around that, as it were, by doing more precise, figuring out how the anatomy precisely works and doing more precise incisions and work that um, would be able to truly heal people. Um, it's really quite remarkable. We owe our medical advances to him and others who worked at that time. The painting by Thomas Eakins uh, is, it's, it's, yeah, I, I words fail me. There's something about this painting that really deeply moves me. Um, because you'll see, uh, excuse me, Dr. Gross standing there in his frock coat. He's holding a knife or a scalpel with a bloodied hand because this was, as you can see from the painting, this was long before, well, not that long before, but it was before people really caught on to the need for sterilization. So it's a bit frightening in that respect. But um, it's them operating on the leg of a patient. And he's standing there, and there's a bunch of people in the background because Dr. Gross is not simply performing the surgery. He's also teaching all of these medical students in, in the theater um, because they were performing this live, as it were, in front of everybody. So it's him standing there sort of just looking, not stern, but just very forthright about what is happening. And... He is being very forthright and honest and uncompromising in here's how we're going to save this, this young man's leg. We're going to cut him open. There's going to be blood. It's going to be ugly. And the painting actually ran into some censorship issues because of its, its great realism. It, it's also, there's a very powerful piece of the painting where you have... Um, the woman who I believe is supposed to be the young man's mother, the young man who's undergoing surgery, it's his mother and she can't, she can't bear to watch because of, you know, how gruesome the procedure is. Um, I bring this up because if I were to write a book on Nietzsche, I would be sorely tempted to find a way to make that the cover of the book, just the painting of the Gross Clinic. Because in my mind, that's, that's kind of like Nietzsche uh, to me. He, you, don't, you don't go around having surgery performed on you for fun. 
you know. Um, it's, it's a dangerous kind of operation. And I see Nietzsche as somebody who's got some blood on his hands. And he's not thinking in terms of conventional good or evil. He's thinking in terms of how do I save the patient? How do I, how does the body actually work? Nietzsche often refers to himself as an immoralist. And that's, that's partly to be provocative. It's partly because of the way that the morals were at, at, at that time. Um, but I think there's something deeper there that he's, in some sense, he would almost work better if he referred to himself as a, as a doctor and as a true doctor who is not concerned with superstitions about right and wrong, but is concerned about health. Because in a lot of ways, this is why I say Nietzsche is inconsistent when he gets into the morality, because uh, clearly he does believe in a polarity of good and bad, but he reassigns it more or less to the notions of health and unhealthiness, and, um, but it's not absolutized. And so, in any case, that, that's my disclaimer at the beginning and my trying to contextualize what Nietzsche is saying. And that, that goes for a lot of this going forward. So, um, yeah, let, I will move into the, uh, the other recording. Why did Nietzsche use the character of Zarathustra? Zarathustra, also known by the Greek Zoroaster, was an ancient Iranian prophet who founded the religion of Zoroastrianism. As with Abraham and Moses, scholars disagree as to when or even whether he lived. It could be anywhere between 1500 and 500 BC. According to tradition, at age 15, he was a priest of the polytheistic Iranian religion. However, at age 30, while sitting beside a riverbank during a spring festival, he saw in vision a divine being who taught him that Ahura Mazda was the only god that should be worshipped. Also, that the universe is caught in a war between absolute good and absolute evil and that human beings have the freedom to choose between the two, but have the duty to choose good. At age 42, he secured the patronage of a queen and could safely establish a religious community. He died peacefully at age 77, and his visions and teachings were compiled into the holy books of Zoroastrianism. The religion exercised tremendous influence throughout the ancient world, especially on Judaism and Platonism, and thus on Christianity. Nietzsche, by his own account, chose Zarathustra as his protagonist because it was only fitting that the first person to teach a new error should also be the first to recognize it as an error. The error was that of absolutizing good and evil and declaring that one must vanquish the other. This state of vanquishment, according to Nietzsche, is envisioned as heaven, where the good gets along just fine without the evil. For Nietzsche, just to be clear, this is like someone claiming that women or men are essentially evil and everything would be better without them. If such a recommendation were taken seriously, it would mean the destruction of the human race. Nietzsche claims it is the same with good and evil. To label some aspect of existence as evil is to imply it is somehow superfluous and we can throw it overboard without consequence. But by getting rid of the yin, you destroy the yang and vice versa. The aim should instead be some kind of a reconciliation. This error is what Nietzsche calls morality. Any system of belief, that is, any system that regulates one's behavior and way of life with absolute prescriptions and prescriptions, will necessarily find themselves running afoul of life herself. If life is a circle, then morality is a line. Thus, every absolute morality will eventually become anti-life, preaching against the better interests of its believers for the sake of an abstract ideal. For Nietzsche, evil is a name used to slander whatever we find disagreeable or questionable 
about human life or existence and generally within the context of a particular culture. So things like pain, death, cruelty, hunger, these things are bad to be sure. He doesn't deny that. They have a different kind of value than the good things. But to call them evil, to use that word for Nietzsche, is to imply that they should be done away with completely, that the good is self-sufficient on its own, and that we do not, in fact, owe the good precisely to the operation of the bad. There is pain, after all, in exercise and growth, and we are most happy and exultant after we have just overcome some great badness, that is, some great obstacle like pain or fear. For Nietzsche, morality is thereby a kind of revenge against existence. One is wronged by something bad and never recognizes how this badness might be turned to one's advantage, might be turned into something good, to use my own language anyway. One prefers a half-baked fantasy of existence to the real thing and resents this dream's impossibility. One would rather destroy existence as it is than to adapt to it. One cannot understand the necessity for the things one dislikes. One is ungrateful for how opposition, pain, suffering, cruelty, illusion have all contributed to the goodness of human life, if only by providing something to overcome. The fact that Nietzsche names his character Zarathustra actually epitomizes this attitude. Zarathustra should be Nietzsche's nemesis, but Nietzsche honors him as a mouthpiece. He does not invent a hell to cast Zarathustra into for creating this great error. He is instead grateful for the obstacle and opposition which Zarathustra provided him and thereby integrates his enemy into the, the system or economy of his own happiness. If he didn't have Zarathustra, he never would have written Thus Spake Zarathustra, to sort of give a trivial example. This would effectively be like, I don't know, a Catholic writing a book like Thus Spake Luther, right? Using Luther as their mouthpiece, or as an evangelical writing Thus Spake Darwin, or Thus Spake Dawkins, or something, right? All of this, believe it or not, I think is encapsulated in the keystone of Nietzsche's teaching through the mouth of Zarathustra, namely the thought of eternal recurrence. Nietzsche explicitly calls this the founding insight of all the work Thus Spake Zarathustra, and it in fact represents the climax of the plot. In brief, eternal recurrence is the idea that rather than an afterlife, Eternity is simply living your life over and over again in exactly the same way. There is no eternal rest. This is your life. Nietzsche's challenge is, would you say yes to this? Are you well disposed to existence as such and to your own life in particular? Are you so constituted that you can digest and draw nourishment from both the good and the bad? Can anything happen to you that you cannot turn to your advantage, that you cannot improvise into your symphony, the symphony of your life, so that your life would actually be less beautiful without it? Would anything be more wonderful to you than the assurance that this life and everything in it is your eternal life, or at the very least represents your eternal life? A few more points about Zarathustra and Nietzsche. According to Lou Salome, when Nietzsche first told her about Zarathustra and the eternal recurrence at the Sacred Mount, he said that his character of Zarathustra represented a kind of imaginary son. Nietzsche did not expect to have children. Zarathustra was compensation for that. Thus, Zarathustra is not a mask or alter ego for Nietzsche. He is a distinct character. Just as a son may resemble his father, but has a life and a mind of his own. He is closer to Plato's Socrates, who may or may not be voicing Plato's own opinions. Even closer still, I think, to Kierkegaard's various pseudonymous authors, 
Yet even these comparisons do not quite capture Nietzsche's strange relationship to Zarathustra. Nietzsche sometimes speaks of Zarathustra, quote, falling upon him, like a personification of artistic inspiration itself. Zarathustra is a kind of artistic genius with whom Nietzsche grapples, not a fictional character entirely under his creative control. Perhaps the closest comparison, I think, is to the cast of characters in Jung's active imagination sessions, like the kind that you find in the Red Book. Jung is explicit that these figures are at once part of him and yet autonomous from him. My point with all of this is that, unlike Nietzsche's other works, Thus Spake Zarathustra feels at once the most personal and the most impersonal. It is not always, if ever, the conscious Nietzsche who is writing. It seems to me that the unconscious must have played a significant role in the book. The upshot being, not everything in Thus Spake Zarathustra can be accounted for using Nietzsche's prior or other work. There is a death of the author here. Nietzsche washes his hands of it. It represents ideas and thoughts that Nietzsche may not have espoused consciously, and yet he acknowledged as his offspring. A final note, again from Lou Salome. She maintained that Nietzsche was, in his nature, essentially religious. And Nietzsche himself wrote that his intimate discussions with Lou were always about religion in one way or other. I don't think that Nietzsche can be properly understood without this acknowledgement that he was indeed a religious soul grappling with an atheistic world. It is telling that the atheist Walter Kaufman did not like Thus Spake Zarathustra, even though Nietzsche himself considered it his most important work by far, for it is paradoxically a religious work, not the work of a contented skeptic. Now, as an epilogue to the uh, original recording, I've decided to quote from a sizable passage from somebody very different from Nietzsche in, uh, in temperament, I think, and, uh, <laughs> well, certainly in religion, because I'm going to quote from St. Augustine uh, from Book 3, Chapter 7 of the Confessions. And uh, as I quote through it, I think you'll see why I am why I am doing so. Uh, so this is, this is book three, chapter seven, uh, section 13 specifically. Quote, nor did I know that true and inward righteousness, which judges not according to custom, but according to the most righteous law of almighty God. By that law, the ways of conduct of different places and times are shaped as is best for those places and times though the law itself is always and everywhere the same, not different in different places or changing with the ages. By this righteousness, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and all those others praised by God were righteous, although they are judged not so by ignorant men who apply the tests of their human minds and measure all the conduct of the human race by the measure of their own custom." They are like a man handling armor and not knowing what piece is meant for what part of the body, and so putting a greave on his head and a helmet on his feet and complaining that they do not fit. Or as if on a given day on which it was illegal to do business in the afternoon, a man should grumble because he is not allowed to go on selling in the afternoon, though he had been in the morning. Or as if in a given house, he should see something handled by one servant, but not allowed to the one who has to pour the wine, or that something were done behind the stable, which is forbidden in the dining room. As if, in short, he should be angry because in the one dwelling house and the one family, the same things are not allowed to every member of the household and in all parts of the house. Such are those who are scandalized when they hear that something was permitted to righteous men in one age and not permitted in another, and that God gave one man this command, another that, as the difference of the age required, yet both alike served the same righteousness, just as in one man and in one day and in one house 
different things are held fitting for different members, and a particular act is lawful now, but not lawful an hour hence, and something is allowed or indeed commanded in one corner which is forbidden and punished in another. Does this mean that justice is unstable and changeable? No, but the times over which justice presides are not alike, for they are times. Men, because their life upon earth is short, are unable of their own observation to compare the conditions of past ages and foreign nations which they have not experienced which those which they have experienced. In the matter of one body or day or house, they can readily see what is fitting for this or that member, this or that moment, this or that part of the house or rank in the household. They accept such differences because they fall within their experience yet remain scandalized at the differences shown in Scripture. I quote that passage because it helps to show that what Nietzsche is talking about is not per se foreign to Christianity. Augustine is acknowledging the problem of changing standards of good and evil over time. He would not, Augustine would not put it in terms of changing good and evil. He tries to show how life or, or rather morality can be extended to, to being grander than, than the morality of any particular time, that God's ways are not our ways, and you, well, you can use the image of the circle and the line I, that I used earlier. I described morality, or rather a given morality, as a line that is straight, and it comes down, but the circle is curved, and so the line can only ever penetrate the circle at either one point by being a tangent or by two points by piercing through it. That being said, I do believe that Nietzsche would, well, he did in fact take umbrage with, with Augustine or, or with anybody trying to turn things into a single morality that applies to everybody. Nietzsche really didn't like that. He, he was in, at bottom, he was fighting for individual freedom and the rights of the individual and the needs of the individual, which is why I like to compare him with a doctor treating each patient according to their body and according to that body's needs. Um, we'll get more into the implications of this later. I have quite a bit to say on it, but, but to, uh, to close out this episode, I'm actually going to read, let me find it again, it's the very next passage in the Confessions that uh, St. Augustine follows up his previous one. This is section 8 from book 3, or rather chapter 8 from book 3. And uh, I'll close out with this because although I suspect Nietzsche might be frustrated with the universal character of this, I don't actually know if that's true. I don't know if he would, in fact, be frustrated. You'll, when I do my, my section on Christianity, I think you'll, Nietzsche's relationship with Christianity, I think you'll know what I mean by that, but I will close off with this um, from Augustine, quote, In no time or place could it be wrong for a man to love God with his whole heart and his whole soul and his whole mind and his neighbor as himself, unquote. So that's how he closes out his talking about cultural relativity, and I'm inclined to agree with him. I'll see you all in the next video.